Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. The flow of Paul's thought. Now, the book of Romans has to be the clearest expression of the good news of Jesus Christ anywhere in the Bible. It's not unduly affected by a local situation or a local need. It's not skewed toward a theological issue. But it's the presentation of Paul's theology to a church he had never met and wanted to visit. And so he kind of lays out his understanding of the good news. And it is just very, very powerful, but somewhat intricate in its design and somewhat confusing in its rabbinical argumentation. So what I want to do is basically outline the, the passage I want to deal with, and then I want to go into some Jewish background out of which you can't understand this passage. So let's look at your Bibles. Now, if you have King James or RSV, you'll notice something strange. After verse 12, there's a dash. Now, what does a dash mean? You don't usually see dashes. <laughs> I think King James has parenthesis marks. This is going to start out with a stated comparison, as, but it never finishes it. It just says as, and then it doesn't, it doesn't give the second half of the comparison. So most commentators would think that verses 13 through 17 is a theological aside. It's a development of this theme, but it's not um, central to the theme. And then in verse 18, we're going to come back and kind of uh, finish out this comparison. Now, the reason this passage has been so difficult, and I want to say to you, many, many people have uh, dealt with this passage, because this is the logical bridge between Romans 1 through 5, which you know all men are lost, all men need Christ. We're justified by a gift of God's grace in Jesus Christ. We showed that in Romans 4 with both Abraham and with David. First part of chapter 5 talks about justification as its subjective truth and objective facts. Now, this little passage we're into is very, very different from all of this, and yet it's a bridge between these basic truths in the first part of Romans and this struggle of the Christian with sin and the law and temptation and doubt that's going to begin in chapter 6. And so it becomes a very important uh, bridge. But it's Jewish, and that's why it's different from us. Now, we live in a country that has emphasized individuality. We talk about individual rights, individual freedoms, the rights of the minorities, and on and on we go, emphasizing that one person is uh, unique and important, and we focus on that even in our evangelical theology that talks about you need to personally respond. And I think that's true. But we've looked at the Bible through the glasses of an individual focus. Now, this chapter is not that. It's this uniquely Jewish concept of corporality. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's take a couple of examples. The author of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 9, uses a very strange argument to show how that the priesthood of Melchizedek, which is found in Genesis 14, is superior to the priesthood of Aaron. Now, of course, Melchizedek will be the kind of priesthood that Christ is. So what, Roman, what Hebrews is saying is that Christ is superior to the Aaronic priesthood. But you know how he does that? This is just going to amaze you. Remember when Lot was taken captive by some of the kings, and Abraham had to take his family and go and fight these kings, and he defeated these kings, and he brought Lot and all of the goods back? And he came to the city of Salem. And in Salem was a Canaanite priest king named Melchizedek. And Abraham, the patriarch of the Jews, offered a tithe to this Canaanite priest king. Now, to Jewish mentality, and this is what's going to be difficult, though um, when Abraham offered a tithe, it showed Melchizedek's superiority. And though Levi, the tribe of priests, doesn't even exist for years and years and years. We've got to get to Isaac and Jacob, and then we'll come to Levi. But in a Jewish sense, Levi was in the loins of Abraham. He was their little bitty person. 
and he will not be born for, for years and years. But that shows that Aaron offered a sacrifice to Melchizedek, and therefore the priesthood of Aaron is lower than the priesthood of Melchizedek. You say, that's a pretty strange argument. Yes, it's corporate. One more, maybe it'll help. Remember when they came into the Promised Land? They were to destroy all the Canaanite cities. The first major city was Jericho. God says, the city belongs to me. Everything that breathes dies. You destroy it. Don't take anything out of it. Burn everything. One Hebrew soldier named Achan in Joshua chapter 7 took some Babylonian clothes and some weight of metal, hid it in his tent. The next day, the Israeli army went to fight Ai, a little bitty city compared to Jericho, and the Israeli army was defeated and several of the Hebrew soldiers died. And Joshua said, God, what has happened? Why have we been defeated? And God told him, there's sin in the camp. And they let the tribes pass by, and the lot fell on Achan's tribe. They let the families pass by, the lot fell on Achan. And Joshua said, what have you done? And he told the story. I had taken the clothes and taken the precious metal. And you know what that people did? They stoned, the people stoned Achan. They stoned Achan's wife. They stoned Achan's kids. They stoned Achan's cows. Now, I can understand how his wife may have known, duplicitous. I can understand how the kids may have known and didn't tell. But Moo Moo? Why kill Bossy in this deal, right? I mean, why stone the cows, for goodness sake? Because the cows belonged to Achan, and Achan's sin affected his whole family, and Achan's sin affected the whole tribe of Israel. Corporality. Now, we're going to hit a concept of corporality here that you're not comfortable with or used to. It is an analogy, and uh, we will talk about that when I get there. The second thing I want to say about this thing is, surprisingly enough, the Bible never tells us the origin of sin. Never tells us the purpose of sin. It does tell us of the terrible consequences and what God is going to do to remove those consequences. It is obvious that sin began in the angelic world. Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, Job 4 are just some of the places that talk about there was rebellion in heaven but with the angels of God apparently before the creation of the world. So uh, sin did not begin with man, but man was impacted by sin and there seemed to be something in the providence of God that allows sin to be in his world. And that's what we're going to look about. Now, let's look together at chapter 5, verse 12. So here is the comparison. As through one man sin came into the world, and death as a consequence of sin, and death spread to all men because all men sinned. Now there's the first part. As through one man. There's a, if any of you have the Jerusalem Bible, which is the modern uh, Roman Catholic translation out of a French translation, you'll have the Apocrypha. And in 2 Esdras chapter 7, Verse 118, it says this, O Adam, what have you done? <laughs> the fall was not yours alone, but ours also, who are your descendants. Someone put it this way, Adam ate something that made the whole race's stomach upset. Something happened in Adam. Adam violated a specific command. What command was that? Genesis 2.17. Now, Eve sinned, but Eve did not violate the command from God. She violated what she heard from Adam. Adam heard from God and open-eyed rebelled against what God told him. And, of course, what Genesis 2.17 is, Of all the trees in the garden you may eat, but of the tree in the midst of the garden you may not eat. In the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Adam, open-eyed, ate that fruit. Now, it wasn't an apple. I'm sorry. Apples don't grow in this part of the world. I know that kind of blows your Sunday school lesson, but it wasn't an apple. But, but he did eat something, and look what it did. And through one man, sin came into the world, and death as a consequence of sin. Death entered, excuse me, sin entered through Adam's rebellion, and death was his shadow. Now, the Bible speaks about three kinds of death. We looked at them when I preached several months ago now on Ephesians chapter 2. 
It says, Adam, the day you eat of this tree, you'll die. But it's obvious that Eve ate and she did not die. She was standing there breathing. It is obvious that Adam ate. He did not die. He was standing there hiding from God. But what the Bible says is the relationship between Adam and God, the relationship between Adam and his wife, the relationship between Adam and the world, the setting into which God had placed him, and even Adam's relationship to himself was disrupted by this act of disobedience. We call this spiritual death. Adam was alienated from God. Not only that, but by Genesis chapter 5, in Genesis 4, Adam's kids start killing each other, but by chapter 5, they're starting to die in the droves. Many people start reading the Bible and never get past chapter 5. We call it the and he died chapter. And it's just a name and a years and he died and he died and he died. So we know, and I, I personally think, that it was not God's will for man, the highest creation of God, to die. But because of personal rebellion, personal sin, wanting to be God's, physical death results from man's spiritual death. There's one more death in the Bible. It's found in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verses 6 and 14. We call it spiritual death. Basically what we're saying is that if man's alienation from God, spiritual death, is not corrected before physical death, then results what we call the second death. It's sometimes called the lake of fire. We would call it eternal from God or hell. And so here we have the kind of death that man is subjected to because of the willful rebellion of Adam. It continues then. Not only did Adam sin and let death into the world, but my goodness, death spread to all men. Now here's the whole point that's going to be made. Adam did something that affected everybody. And then it, then it adds up, because all men sin. You ought to look up 1 Corinthians 15:22. Uh, as through one man's sin, all died. Through one man's act of obedience, all are made alive. That's that same kind of thing there. It's really a play on, on what we call the Adam-Christ typology. And I want to cover that when I come to the end of verse 14. I want to hold it till there. What does it mean, because all men sinned? Well, it is true that death spread from Adam's sin, and suddenly everybody was dying... Some theologians say, well, what we inherited from Adam is the propensity to sin, the inclination to sin. This is what the rabbis believe. The rabbis do not make a big deal out of Genesis 3, out of what we call original sin. They say that in every man's heart are two yetzers, which is their word for intent. There's a good intent and an evil intent. A yetzer hara, a yetzer hatov. And which, they say, is a black and white dog. And the one you feed the most is the one that gets the biggest and dominates your life. Now, I have one problem with that. Did Adam's sin affect us so every person themselves sin and that's why they die? Well, now, wait a minute. What about children that die? Uh, what is that about? I think that all of us would realize that children... Uh, uh, at a, especially a very young age, cradle children, they cert certainly couldn't die because of their own sin. What can they do? Kick the slats out of the cradle? Cuss mama? I mean, what can they do as a baby? They can't be sinning themselves. So how can we say that it's the intensity or the propensity to sin? I don't think that'll work. Then what is it in Adam? What Adam did is he violated a specific command of God. And somehow everyone was affected by that. What do you mean? Death entered through Adam and death affects all of us. Somehow we participated in Adam's sin. You say, well, that's not fair. My friend, it's only not fair to you because you're not used to thinking corporately. The Bible says it over and over. The sins of the father will be visited on the children to the what? Third and fourth generations. Do you have the same kind of thing of corporality? In Deuteronomy 9, 7 it says, But those who love him, God will love to the thousandth generation. There we have corporality. There is both positive corporality and negative corporality. In Adam we have negative corporality. Adam sinned and all of us were affected. All of us are guilty before God. Are we sinners because we sin, or do we sin because we're sinners? 
Well, the theological answer is yes. But the priority is we sin because we're sinners. Uh, Adam set an atmosphere in which all of us have rebelled against God, and not only the propensity, but Adam affected us. Now, you'll see that's very important to his argument. Watch with me, if you would. Certainly sin was in the world before the law was given, but it was not charged to men's account where there is no law. It's a strange little verse that says, between the days of Adam and the days of Moses, and we don't know how long that is. It could thousands of years in there. Between the time of Adam and the time of Moses, people did do things that, w that wasn't pleasing to God. But because they had no direct command, God did not charge them with that sin. Now, there wasn't the tree of life for men to eat of or knowledge because that was the Garden of Eden was excluded from man. So man was doing things that hurt his fellow man. Man was doing idolatrous things. But since there was no commandment, God did not impute that sin to them. He didn't count that. But what happened? Still, even though there was no law for them to violate, from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, everybody died. That shows that all of them, though they didn't commit a rebellious act themselves, are affected by what Adam did. Adam opened the door to death, and death leveled everybody. Now, if you want two other verses that kind of lend themselves the same truth, it'd be Romans 3.25 and Acts 17.30, and you can look at the parallel there. Now, and yet death reigned. I think the best title for this sermon, Sin is Personified, Death is Personified, The Life of Christ, Justification is Personified. I've entitled this sermon, Who Reigns? Who acts as king in your life? One of two choices, sin and death, or the Lord Jesus. Death reigned from Adam till Moses over those who had not sinned in the way Adam had against a positive command. For Adam was a figure of him who was to come. This is the Greek word type. We get typology or type. The word just type from it. What, what does it mean that, that Adam was a type of Jesus? Now think with me. Paul uses this over and over. And I want to give you three other places where you can find it in Paul, but it makes it so clear. 1 Corinthians 15, hope you'll write this down, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 21 and 22, and also verses 45 through 49. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22, 45 through 49. 2 Corinthians 5, 14, 2 Corinthians 5, 14, and a beautiful passage that I preached on here just a few months ago, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. This Adam-Christ typology. And what is this typology? Through one man's sin, death entered the world and death spread to all men. Through one man's act of righteousness, justification, forgiveness entered the world and forgiveness spread to all men. And that's, what, that's this major thrust here. I think it's interesting that we stop for a moment and recognize that Paul's argument does have a flaw. Now, it's not unusual. All analogies break down at some point. No uh, example is perfect. And here's the flaw. In Adam, none of us had a choice whether we would participate in Adam's sin. Because we're human, we were caught in that sin. Everybody who was ever born was caught in the sin of Adam. But in the righteousness of Christ, we do have a choice, and we must exercise that choice to be a part of the forgiveness that is found in Christ. So one is involuntary and one is voluntary, which means I don't think this is teaching universalism that all will be saved in the end, but I do think this is teaching that all are potentially saved in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 15 begins a, a brand new thrust, and the thrust is this. But God's free gift. Oh, man, do I like to preach about God's free gift. I want you to look at your Bibles. This word is twice in verse 15, twice in verse 16, once again in verse 17. It's repeated from chapter 3, verse 24. It's mentioned in that beautiful passage of chapter 6, verse 23. It's found in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Everything that God has done for us in Jesus Christ is free with no strings attached. 
This passage is saying this. You're not right with God because you're so hot. You're not right with God because you don't sin. You're not right with God because of who your parents are. You're not right with God because of your theology. You're right with God because of the finished work of Jesus Christ plus nothing. Amen, Bob. It should have been there. The free gift. The free gift, the no strings attached, unconditional grace of God did something that none of us could earn or merit or purchase or deserve. It's, it's salvation as a gift from the grace of God to sinful man. It wasn't that we were worthy of it. The amazing thing about the gift of God is while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Herein is God's love, not that he loved us. I mean, not that we loved him, but that he loved us and gave himself on our behalf. Oh my, the gift of God. Not to be compared at all with the offense. For by the one man's offense, now my translation is what we call dynamic equivalent, kind of like your new international. It's going to change the Greek word, the one and the many. It's a play through here. You don't see it in my, in my translation. I hope you see it in yours. The one affected the many. And the many has to be, has to be all men. Now, watch what I'm doing. Adam's the one, the one, the sinner, affected the many, the whole human race. Jesus, the one, act of righteousness affected. Now, the Bible says the many. And this is where, this is where really tough Calvinism comes in. Some would say, well, God chose some to be saved and some to be damned. Uh, God chose these and didn't choose these. That's a bit tough for me. I think in Jesus Christ, God chose everybody that will. I think in Jesus Christ's death, the whole world was potentially saved. This word, the many, is a play going back to the suffering servant song of Isaiah 53. And in Isaiah 53, 6, it says, the Messiah gave his life for the many, meaning the all. It doesn't make sense in any way. If Adam's sin affected all, Jesus' righteousness has to affect who? All. Man, I don't know if I'm included in the elect or not elect, but I am in the all. Amen? And so are you. So here we have the whole human race being affected by one man's offense. And look at this. Much greater degree, God's favor, God's grace, God's gift imparted by His grace through the one man, Jesus Christ, has overflowed for the whole race of men. John Calvin took these verses right through here, 15, 16, and said, this is Calvin now, grace overflows sin, there's going to be more in heaven than there are in hell. Now, when you look at the population of the world, and you see what Calvin just thought this implied. There's a great revival coming. <laughs> Amen? I get so nervous about this. We want to clip every little group off that doesn't agree with us. God's not in the clipping business, but in the including business in Jesus Christ. People say, do you believe they're Christians? If they trust Christ, they are. Yeah, but they have this little weird thing about them. You're not weird? <laughs> Let him who is not weird stand up, right? <laughs> We're all weird. <laughs> The trick is the grace of God, not the weirdness of man. And the gift, not at all to be compared with the results of that one man's sin, for the sentence resulted from the offense of one man, and it meant condemnation. Now, here's a legal term, a law court, condemnation. But the free gift resulted from the offense of many, and it meant, now mine has, and I'm in verse, the last part of verse 16, right standing. Now, look at your Bibles. You probably have... Justification, justify the many, something like that. This is a word we've got to stop and look at because I think we've just really misunderstood this. This is the major doctrine of Protestantism. This is Martin Luther's clarion call. We call it justification by faith. Now listen to me. The word righteousness, the word righteous, the word right standing, the word just, the word justification, the word justify, all come from one Greek root that goes back to a Hebrew word. The Hebrew word is a word that meant a river reed, R-E-E-D. It's about 15, 20 foot tall, grew in the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley. 
Now, you could measure the vertical wall of a building with a plumb line. But how do you measure the horizontal wall, the, the straightness of the horizontal? You do it with these measuring reed. And so this way to measure a standard, we would call it a measuring stick, came to be the word that God used for himself. God became the standard. The word justifies, original etymological meaning is to conform to a standard. Every word for sin, both in Hebrew and in Greek, means a deviation from the standard. To be twisted, to be crooked, to be bent, to miss the mark, on and on and on. It's, it, something happened to the straight standard. It got crooked, it got bent. But God made it straight again. How? You say, well, he, he, he took that person and changed them. Yeah, he did, but he did it this way. The law, the law was meant to show us the will of God, but it made it, what it showed us was that we're all crooked. There's not a straight person in here. We're all crooked. What Jesus did is take the Old Testament law and the Sermon on the Mount, took it from Acts and took it into the thought life, made it even harder than it ever was before. Then he fulfilled it in his own sinless life, died on a cross as a sinless person, gave the righteousness of God right back to us as a free gift. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God took him who knew no sin, made him to become sin, that we might become the standard, the righteousness, the justification of God in him. Now we have it for, to our account the standard, the righteousness of God. Given to, that's why the Bible says, Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Be holy as God is holy. Who can do that? No one. No one except Jesus, and he gives it back to us as a free gift. Yes, we are conformed. To, it's like we stand before the law court, and the judge looks at us, and it's obvious we're guilty. It's obvious we've done what we've been accused of. It's obvious we're without hope. It's obvious we're condemned. And someone takes the penalty for us, and we are declared righteous. That's what this is all about. You say, but I've got to work and do and be. No, you don't. You have to yield and believe and repent. It's a free gift. It comes in the finished work of Christ, and it comes nowhere else. None of us is good. The Bible is so clear that all of us have sinned. I think that embarrasses some of us. But that's the, that's the message here. We've all sinned in Adam. God help us. That's the argument. But I would go further and say all of us have chosen to sin ourselves. The Bible puts it so well when it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. Each have turned into his own way. None of us have sought after God. The Roman summary is, the, uh, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Roman summary is, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God, woo, free gift of God, is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Right standing. It's a legal, forensic, declared righteousness. Look at verse 17. For if by first class conditional, this it was what happened, one man's offense, death reigned through the one. Much greater degree will those who continue to receive the overflow of his unmerited favor and the gift of right standing with himself reign, this is a future tense, shall reign in real life through the one Jesus Christ. Man, I tell you, we're just looking forward to that day when all of us stand before God. Uh, folks, you're going to stand before God. And there's no excuse then. My mother made me do it. Oh, yeah, sure she did. My educational system warped me. No, you were warped to start out with. It's just the way I am. Well, yeah, it's terrible. We're going to stand before God for who we are. That there's, a, there's a day coming when God will judge the hearts of men. Folks, I do not want justice from God. Deliver me from what I deserve. I want the grace, the unmerited, free gift of God in Jesus Christ on that day when I stand before the Creator of the universe. And we're all going to stand there. Death reigned, but because of what Jesus has done, we can reign now and in the future. Look at verse 18. Here's the summary of the whole thing. So... As through one's offense, which resulted in condemnation for all men, just so through one act of righteousness, there resulted right standing involving the life of all men. Potential. For just as by that man's disobedience, the whole race of men were constituted sinners, 
so by this one's obedience the whole race of men may be brought into right standing with God. Look at verse 20. Then the law crept in to multiply offense. What's that talking about? He's saying, look, from the time of Adam, the time of Moses, everybody died. They were all guilty. But the law came. Why? You say the purpose of the law was to bring men to God. Not so. It was to help men understand God. It was to help the men live with each other. But the purpose of the law was never to make men right. If you read the Old Testament, it's no more than a series of miserable failures of the very people to whom the law was given to. Now, they thought it was a blessing that God would reveal himself. But what God was showing is man is sinful. His heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? His intention is on evil every day. But you know what? Though we were all condemned under sin, all of us are rebels. Look what he did. Look what he did. Resulting in right standing. For just as a man, one man sinned, one man was righteous, and what the law did was show us that all men are sinful. All men are sinful. Verse 19. Excuse me. Verse 21. Though sin has multiplied, yet God's favor has surpassed it and overflowed it. Danny, I was thinking that him, grace greater than all our sin. That may not mean much to you, so you've really been a jerk in life. So you've really played the fool. So you think, there's no hope for me. Look what I've done. Look what I think. Look what I, what I did. Friend, you don't know the grace of God. You can't sin enough that God doesn't love you. You can't sin away your day of grace. If we could sin away our day of grace, we all wouldn't have any grace. God's mercy overflows. I don't know who you are or what you've done, but I know God loves you and died for you and whosoever will may come. What a message! And it's the message of this wonderful book. So that just as sin has reigned by death, so God's grace too might reign in right standing with God, which issues an eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Come to Him. <laughs> Why will you be out there trying to make your own way, trying to be right with God? Everything that's needed for anyone and everyone and whosoever will and as many as is available in the free gift of God in Jesus Christ. And the invitation is, come. Come. God likes sinners. That's all he has to work with. God paid the full price. You can't add to it. It's available. It's a free gift. There it is right there. Whosoever will may come. Whosoever calls the name of the Lord, as many as receive him. Now, you know what the problem is? It's embarrassing to us. If it was hard, we would like it better. If we had to work for it, we could brag about it more. But it's kind of humiliating to say, I don't deserve that. I'm just a sinner. I've been running from God. And God says, yes, but I love you. And I want you to know me. And I've sent my son to die for you. And everything that's necessary for you to have eternal life, to have an indwelling Holy Spirit, to have your sins forgiven, to have a place prepared in heaven, to know Jesus is coming again for you is just to take the gift. Friend, there it is. Will you take it? Whosoever will may come. Oh, Lord, we play such religious games. We make it so hard. It's so easy. Thank you for a gift that man can't mess up. Thank you for a work that's finished and complete and need not be added to. And thank you for the wooing and the calling of the Holy Spirit of God that even now is speaking to the hearts and minds of those who may not know him. Friends, we're not asking you to come to church and be good. We're asking you to trust Christ. Christ, your only hope for heaven, 